right? So just a, a simple example here. Now, if we were to come back and let's go ahead and zoom back to a normal size. So there's my button with some complex inner content. If I flip back to my markup, as you would expect, the button now contains a stack panel, and that stack panel has my ellipse and my text block. Right? So just one little way that Blend can make our lives a wee bit easier by uh, letting us kind of drill into that, you know, uh, selected control to really kind of tweak that internal nested content. And this was just a simple example. You could obviously get a lot more elaborate than I did. Okay. So remember the key, we want to go ahead and uh, make sure we've double clicked on what we need to edit. And then we can just start to uh, zoom on in and uh, either drag and drop or just double click things from our toolbox. Okay, so let's get on to this more exotic topic, right? If you've come to WPF or Silverlight from other graphical toolkits like uh, MFC or maybe ATL, Windows Forms, VB6, all these different graphical toolkits, you know, they all have their own spin on rendering services. And when you're working with these toolkits, it wasn't necessarily something you did all the time. You know, a lot of times in these toolkits, you didn't need to get a device context or a graphics object unless you were literally doing something like maybe painting a pie chart based on a database read. Well, in the world of WPF and Silverlight, um, the ability to render graphics is way more common than it ever was. And the reason is because these are really graphical intensive APIs. They're really meant to build the eye candy. Okay, So Blend has a particular part of the editor which allows you to get access to all of the different shape types. And I think you know that the shapes are just one category of graphical rendering agents. The thing which is really great about the shapes is that they extend a couple of common parent classes which give you a ton of functionality. So if you were to use the rectangle, okay, this little rectangle class, it isn't just simply maintaining a top left, bottom right with a background color. This guy has pretty much as much functionality as any other widget, like a button. So in the world of WPF and Silverlight, if you want to go ahead and uh, you know, capture when a mouse is inside of your geometry, all you got to do is handle the mouse enter event. You don't have to calculate any kind of coordinates. You don't have to do any kind of hard coding to figure out where is the mouse cursor. Is it inside of the area that I've defined? This just happens for free. So things like hit testing, drag and drop functionality, that's kind of a cakewalk under WPF and Silverlight. And other things too, you know, if you wanted to have a right click menu system or you wanted to have maybe a uh, tool tip over a geometry, that's also painfully simple. You just simply pretend you're working with a button. So when we're using Blend to work with these shapes, you got to remember that these guys typically are the starting point for custom controls. So I'm not saying that you're going to have to use these areas to just paint some oddball shape and be done with it. Okay, um, As you're going to see in just a little bit, these oddball shapes can become much more interesting things. So let's go back over to Blend. And I'm going to actually get rid of this button. We're done with him. Okay, So we're back to an empty layout root. So let's go take a look at this area. right? Um, the drawing types that correspond to the system.windows.shapes types, they're going to be divided into two areas in your toolbox. Okay, Here we really have a direct mapping to the rectangle, ellipse, and line classes. But here we have these things called pens and brushes. These are both used to build path objects. All right? And by default, what Blend is going to do is it's going to use that little micro modeling language. So let's imagine that we want to use uh, the pencil. Okay, if we were to use the pencil, this is for doing totally freehand drawing. So if I were to just build some odd shape here, right? If I flip back over to my markup, I'm going to see that I have a path, and the data property 
has been configured with this little micro language. Now, nobody in their right mind is ever going to expect any of us to manually type this kind of garbage in by hand. And if someone's asking you to do that, you might want to educate that person. <laughs> because this is something which is tool generated, right? Um, you may not know this, but this little micro language is really, believe it or not, a shorthand notation for a much, much more robust object model using these things called geometries. Okay? So if you were to use the tool um, expression design, that tool typically renders out your paths using those geometries. So you might find quite a bit more markup there. Okay, here, even though this string can appear to be pretty darn gnarly, this is actually shorter than what we would have if we uh, use the corresponding object model. Okay, whoop, a little too many undos there. Still too many. <laughs> Let me go back here, sorry about that. I just totally wiped off my guy. <laughs> we'll delete him again. And then we'll put back up my geometry. Okay, so we'll go back to the pen, the pencil. And we got our guy in here. Right? Now, the pen is a little bit different. This allows you to make a series of connection points. And then for each one, I can start to kind of flip it out here. Uh, the reason it keeps snapping here, in case you're wondering, is I, I still have the stack panel as my default layout manager. Right? So this allows us to get a little more exotic in the shapes that we're trying to build. Uh, the remaining three here are real straightforward. Right? You just kind of get whatever you get. Now, that alone is OK, but I want to show you some more interesting things that we can do. So let me actually get rid of both of these. And just so we don't keep snapping things back, why don't we put this guy to a more appropriate canvas. So imagine that we are over here, and we're going to draw a little rectangle. Maybe we're going to put an ellipse over here. Okay? And maybe we have some intersecting areas. Well, using Blend, I'll go ahead and get the selection. Right? I can select multiple geometries, and as soon as I do that, I'm going to have access to a whole bunch of different operations to um, make new geometries, uh, specifically to make new path objects. So here I could do like a um, intersection of these two things. So if I were to select that option, I would just see this little part pop in. Right? That's the intersection. If I were to do another operation to maybe do a combine and do a unite, right? Well, now we can see it kind of did the inverse. It found the intersection area, carved it out, and connected the endpoints. So using these particular options, we can just kind of reshape things to new paths. So just to make sure we get that, you know, right now I really have a rectangle and an ellipse. So in my markup, I see these two simple definitions. But if I were to do a combine, Maybe we'll do a divide. Now we come back over here, and we now have a path. Right? So it kind of did a transformation on those selected items to kind of reshape it into a path. And again, it uses that little data modeling language, the geometries.